I am Ozil Bangert, a physicist working in the Bernal Institute of the University of Limerick as one of the Bernal Chairs and my field is electron microscopy. I start my talk with a question, how on earth did I get into electron microscopy? I always liked drawing, painting, animation and was enrolled in a course at Düsseldorf Art Academy in Germany after leaving school when it came to me that I had to do science if I wanted to understand the world. So I changed my course and studied physics. Did it help me to understand the world though? Heck no. It raised more questions than answers. In my first job as a postdoctoral assistant in the University of Surrey in the UK, electron microscopy was part of my job description. I did not even know then what uh, an electron microscope, a transmission electron microscope, I call it TEM for short now, was and I avoided this part of my job and concentrated on other investigation methods but towards the end of my PDIA employment uh, my supervisor said Ushi you have to do electron microscopy now it is, was part of your job description we have to deliver so there was no way around it anymore and there was also not much help uh, and instructions so I sat for weeks in a darkened room and tried to teach myself and see something and then suddenly I saw the light and I never looked back. The revelations I had were unbelievable. One can actually see things that are described in physical theories about materials, things that have only been conceptual so far. The TEM shows us also things that probably should not exist in nature, as they do not fit into the current system of understanding. But since they can be observed, there must be a reason for their occurrence and in time we will find out not least with the help of electron microscopy. And it's all imagery and added a very much missed and welcome artistic overtone to my scientific undertakings. So underlying all material sciences and of paramount importance for materials applications concerning hard and soft materials is the knowledge of the material structure. In this modern day and age, this is obtained via electron microscopy which can look into the atomic detail of a material. And the images you have just seen are defects that have occurred in an aluminium alloy after having undergone cyclic fatiguing, so rattling if you want so, to simulate effects that would happen to aeroplane wings during vibrations when it's flying through the wind. To reveal the occurrence and nature of this defect structure, I did this on a project with British Aerospace, it was important in finding ways to change this alloy by adding other elements so as to prohibit its destruction in real-world applications. Investigations of defects in all materials have proven extremely important. Only electron microscopy could give us the necessary information and understanding without which we would not have solved the problem. Why, for example, airplanes would fail to fly, why bridges would not hold, why nuclear reactors would be unsafe. There would not be today's developments of computers, mobile phones, DNA sequencing or understanding of ne neural networks. There would not be the knowledge for, um, of local atomic structures leading to the development of novel materials. So, let's turn to beautiful things first. So, here we see a diamond ring and we focus on a facet and zoom in. And there you can see there's already some um, defects on that facet which would not appear to the naked eye when you look at it. And we zoom in and we can see the atomic structure and it's enhanced the contrast and so the uh, bright blobs are couples of atoms and I overlay the ball and stick model now and you can see in the middle there is a big irregularity in the periodic lattice. It's a defect. Now what is this defect? Now, if we join up the atomic rows, as I've done here, then we can see um, one of them is stopping in the middle of the crystal. And uh, these atomic rows, in fact these lines now um, signify crystal lattice planes. So one of these planes is stopping and if we make a, um, draw a line along the ledge of it, then this blue line here signifies a dislocation. To show the principle of the creation of a dislocation, an atomic model of a 3D lattice is shown here and uh, you can see again simplified version it's a cube with lattice planes and if we pull the top half against the bottom half so we shear it then in opposite directions then we see slip edge which is introduced in the material 
and if we draw a line along the start of this slip edge which goes across the crystal, then we can see this is a dislocation. And then we look at this structure from the top. That is what you would see in an electron microscope, in a transmission electron microscope. There's a blue line and then I show the picture. There we are. This is the um, image of dislocations. Now, if we keep pulling this material, we shearing it, then zip, the dislocation, moves across and leaves behind a slip edge along the whole crystal, which displaces the top half with respect to the bottom half. If we carry on pulling, then we introduce multiple slip edges and you can see the material elongates and then it suddenly breaks. It is surprising how faulty and flawed everything is and yet still works. There is nothing perfect in nature. Uh, you go into depth and you reveal how much more complex the truth is than the concept. Defects and dislocations are most important properties of materials. They are destructive, but they are also essential entities to help make materials viable for applications. They make them ductile. If they didn't have dislocations, they would be very strong, but if a lot of stress is applied, they would just crack. So, ductility and flexibility is most important for construction materials. However, defects have to be controlled, otherwise aeroplanes would fall down out of the sky, bridges would break, as we have previously seen in the uh, example of the continued slip, which leads to breakage. So, understanding of defects enables materials development to avoid this. Another example are materials used in information technology, IT. Without electron microscopy, IT at today's standards would not be possible. No computers, no mobile phones, no internet, no iCloud technology. Devices that are used here are all crucially um, depending on interfacing different semiconductor materials with each other. So making what we call hetero interfaces or structures thereof. And none of our modern age electronics and ICT development would have been possible without this. Again, all this heavily depends on getting materials right. Semiconductor light emitting diodes or lasers, for example, which are used in endless numbers of applications like Blu-ray players, projectors, environmental monitoring, medical diagnostic, handheld displays and laser pointers. These lasers are actually the size of a grain of sugar and here I'm actually showing such a laser diode placed on the eye of a needle just to show the scale. Now, in the next slide, you see the um, functionality and the sketch of the laser diode. I'm not going into detail, but what I want to point out is this active region in the middle where the light comes out. It's a trapeze-shaped block. When these lasers were developed, after a number of hours of running, they stopped working. I worked with a company which developed them and I was asked whether I could find out what caused this failure. And this was what I found. After weeks of developing methods to actually slice this, this sugar grain even smaller and thinner, and that was before there were any um, um, instruments to do this available, like FIBS. So here, I managed to do this now, and I zoom into this trapeze-shaped region. And this is where the light is emitted. And after many, many hours of, 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 of um, running this laser, the light goes out and we can see why. Defects have developed in the corners where this trapeze-shaped block is embedded in other material. As I said it's heterostructures. They fit, but there's strain, there's strain involved. And when the laser works and is running and has voltage applied and current uh, flowing through it, then dislocations form due to the stresses their non-radiative recombination centers. This research has helped the company, General Electric's company, to revise their laser design and substantially improve their lasers. Nanoscale investigations in a TEM are indispensable in the frame of the ever-increasing partaking of nanomaterials in our lives. Nanomaterials have a much larger surface-to-volume ratio than bulk materials and surfaces in themselves are defects because they're discontinu discontinuities. So they're imperfections. Especially 2D materials. These have initiated a world revolution in materials applications starting with graphene. They only consist of surfaces and surfaces 
behave very differently from bulk. They often have unsaturated chemical bonds, dangling bonds like free hands, and can grab hold of loads of things like elements from the atmosphere, water, carbon, contaminants. This does not happen in bulk materials where all hands are full. We do not know these 2D materials very well yet at all, so it is of utmost importance to investigate them. Especially in the case of a one atomic layer thick material, we have to do these investigations on the atomic scale. Hence, high-end TEM going down to this level is absolutely indispensable. Here I show a small transparent graphene flake Spend it on a holy, what's called a holy carbon grid, which in turn is spend it on a larger gold grid. And uh, you can see, if I enlarge it, um, there are obviously the underlying, the holes in that film are important to let the electrons go through. So when I reach the end of the magnification that I can get in an optical microscope, I have to put this sample in an electron microscope and I can further enlarge it. There is the edge of the graphene. And then we see something very, very amazing. If you enlarge it further, that image just shows a lot of crud. So the graphene is actually dirty in itself. So all these, uh, you know, um, this conception that graphene is clean and f wonderful is not true. So what we see here, if we zoom in, we see um, a clean bit and if we zoom in further we can actually see the atomic structure and we can see the hexagonal lattice and there is an atom missing, it's a vacancy and if I enhance the contrast in the perfect surrounding part of the lattice we can see the perfect hexagonal rings that the ball and stick model is overlaid. We zoom out again so all the white and grey regions are dirt. We zoom into another area, so here we see um, a double vacancy. And then we carry on and something has attached itself to the double vacancy and it's a silicon atom. Now if this happens, this also happens with other atoms, in particular metals, then something called metal mediated etching, or the etching is catalyzed by the, by the metals, occurs and the metals then the metal atoms here, you can see them as the white little dots. They zoom around the hole in graphene and enlarge it and enlarge it and enlarge it and make it bigger. So this is an inherent problem because if you want to make graphene or want to employ it in um, electronic components, you have to make a metal contact. And the metal eats the graphene up, so what do you do? So it needs desperate investigation, this problem. Another misconception is that um, graphene is wonderful, flat and continuous, but it's not. You can see here, it, in reality, it's actually rippled. And here in the electron micrograph, you can see ripples as um, the hills and the bottoms of the ripples as the lighter colors. Well, all this is not, these are not easily revealed properties and require advanced microscopy methods. Without TEM, there would be a severe lack in the understanding of materials, especially regarding the atomic scale structure. New nanoscience, novel materials development crucially depend on this. And with the Nobel Prize material, graphene, whose structural investigations I was involved in with the Manchester Graphene Group right from the start, and Andre Geiman and Kostya Novoselov got the Nobel Prize in 2010, so this graphene is an example to show how important the role of TEM is. Now, with the new Titan Themis, which we had, have acquired at UL, we can achieve magnifications the order of 10 million times, showing features that are separated on the picometer range. Well, the microscope is put into this cube to shield it from external influences, smallest airflow or temperature changes. And if you open the cube, or if you look through it, like you see how, how complex it is, and the little stick man I put to the si at the side of it shows the actual size of a human being in comparison to this microscope. Fitted out with top-of-the-range spectroscopic facilities like energy dispersive X-ray and electron energy loss spectrometer, 
It can also reveal the chemical nature of elements and the electronic structure as well. If optimally aligned, then we can use um, this microscope to determine at the, the individual nature of atoms. So here is again our graphene, and if you look at it, I'll show it in detail now, there, is, um, there are red atoms in the middle of the blue and green are caffeine atoms, and they are nitrogen atoms. And um, this was found by electron energy loss spectroscopy, and we have um, done this on purpose. We have put nitrogen in. We want to do dope and functionalize graphene. We didn't know whether it would work. And lo and behold, there, we could see they are there, exactly where we wanted to put them. And this is the first. So additionality to the atomic structure and the chemistry investigations on the atomic scale, we can furthermore interrogate with the electron beam nanoscale optical behavior of materials. And here we can see a silver wire that has light emission at around three electron volts in the, in the blue and ultraviolet regime. And we can also see the pattern of these light emissions. So with our new Titan theme is at UL, we also intend to get um, novel specimen holders, we can do even more than um, imaging and chemical analysis. We can actually bias specimens under observation. We can put them in liquids, we can put them in gaseous atmospheres, and we can also simultaneously heat them. These in situ measurements can be done with sub-microsecond event filming. Um, so we can observe defects move, elements react chemically, and this can tell us a hell of a lot about materials behavior under various externally implemented conditions and will reveal nanoscale chemical growth mechanisms and a materials response to various real life stressing conditions that has been never achievable before. And it will reveal so far totally unknown mechanisms leading to novel scientific discoveries about materials. Investigations in this new TEM will also uh, and especially be geared towards chemical and biological materials. And an entirely new direction we are starting and following at UL concerns crystal structure solutions via a new electron diffraction based method, which is especially applicable to materials in the pharma and protein crystal sector. Now I need to mention that um, much of this work shown here was done at unique facilities, uh, the SuperSEM facility at Dansbury, UK, and the Ernst Ruska Center um, for Microscopy and Spectroscopy with Electrons in the Forschungszentrum Mühlich uh, in Germany. It is a fantastic opportunity and goes with a job to go all over the world for collaboration. And this collaboration is essential as there are only few of these much needed top microscopy centers around. So thank you, everyone who contributed. And UL is going to be one of these centers soon and an international leader in the field of electron microscopy. If you want to find out more, please feel free to contact me. My name is Ozil Bangert. I am uh, one of the chairs in the Bernal Institute at the University of Limerick. And I am, as I said, doing electron microscopy and imaging.